Welcome to Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. Today, more time with Jack San Felice as he tells us about one of the famous Dutch hunters. As a matter of fact, he's got a mountain named after him up there in the mountains, Hermit Petrash. Well, when I first came out here to Arizona, books were scarce as hen's teeth on the Superstition Mountains. And the, and most the books that had been written, uh, there were only a couple could even had photographs or could tell you something that you could actually find. And that's like finding treasure itself. I found these two little books, one by Bob Ward, Ripples of Lost Echoes, and one by Bob Garman, Mystery Gold of the Superstitions. It's a great story. And so after I, after I had been searching for the Dutchman's Trail on the West End, I decided to try to find the location of the cabin, because the cabin, Herman's cabin, Herman Petrash. Give us a little background on Herman Petrash. That Herman Petrash was one of the first Dutch hunters. Now, if I could digress, I don't want to go through the whole story of the first Dutch hunters, but the first Dutch hunters was, was, were <clears throat> Herman, his brother Reine, their father Gottfried, and Julia Thomas, four, if I'm right. Okay, the Dutchman's dead, but Herman was part of that first search group of the Lost Dutchman Mine, and he searched the mountains many, many years. All right, young man, where did you get your information from? In 1953, um, Bob Garman went out and interviewed Herman. Herman lived off of Hewitt Station Road, right within sight of literally the ranch house owned by Billy Martin Jr. on Hewitt Station Road. Well, Billy Martin's father helped Herman. Herman worked for Billy Martin Sr. and in building things, he was a handyman. He did a lot of things. And so he helped him build some things in, uh, in the uh, superstitions where uh, line cabins and whatnot, wells, digging wells and uh, re-digging wells, water holes for the cattle. And so Herman, as he got older, built a shack right on U.S. Station Road. Herman's story is well known by Billy Martin Jr. And Billy Martin Jr. was the first cowboy that I met uh, riding up uh, U.S. Canyon Road. I come across the cowboy, and it's, it is Billy Martin Jr. As time went by, I interviewed him many times, and um, Billy was the treasure trove of information if you knew how to decipher what he said. But one of the things he did say, there's a little book on it, and you should get that little book. And so I found it, and uh, I bought the book, and lo and behold, in there, Herman Petrash's story, and there are two stories that kind of uh, dovetail into each other. And so an interview is being is conducted by Bob Garman, who writes it in this particular book. And there's another interview that's published in a newspaper by a female reporter, but she writes a nice story about Herman too. And it has to deal with Herman and the lost Dutchman mine, and were there really any mines out there in the eastern section that had gold in the Superstition Mountains. Well, Herman died the very next day after Garmin interviewed him. He was on his last legs. Remember, Herman probably was in his 80s at the time, 88 years old maybe. So Herman was the brother of Reine that knew the Dutchman. His brother, Reine, the one who listened to the Dutchman tell the stories and wrote the notes of where to find a mine and wrote a map out for them. But the Dutchman, Jacob Walsh, you see, wrote it all out in German so that English people wouldn't be able to understand it. And he gave, and he gave these notes to Reine, well, Reine and Julia. <clears throat> when Gottfried and Herman come down from Colorado in that August of... 1892, the Dutchman died in October of 1891, but they wanted, they were mining, they were mining up in Colorado, 
And you know, if you're there in October, November, December, you can't get out of Colorado. If you're in a mine, you're stuck there. The snows will get you. So th they didn't come down there until the summer after the, the trails were open. So they made it down by horseback down from Colorado to Arizona, to Phoenix, rather. And so that August of 1892, the father of Riney and Herman, Gottfried was his name, Gottfried, who spoke mostly German, they need him because he's a miner and Herman's a miner. Riney worked for Julia when she owned a bakery. Uh, and Herman... He was a miner, and he knew about mining. He was a prospector. And so they came down to help search. So there's Julia sell, sells her bakery to get money. To get, she owned it by then. She, uh, she had divorced E.W. Thomas, who, by the way, was Thomas's bakery. And there are advertisements in many of the old newspapers of the 1880s and 90s of, of Tom, E.W. Thomas' bakery. And there was a sign on it. It was that... 137 West Washington, I believe. So they go in the mountains in there searching for it in August. And they don't find it. They're on the western end of the Superstition Mountains. By the way, they walked right by, right past in 1893. One more year, they would find the Black Queen, the Mammoth Mine, and the bulldog mine would all open up about the same time. And all those, go and Goldfield would be established. The town, the mining camp of Goldfield, about 3,000 people in its existence. It only lasted about five years, Goldfield. The mammoth millions and millions, I think 60,000 ounces of gold were taken out of the mammoth mine alone. And I know that uh, the Black Queen still produces gold because I some of the ore from it. And uh, get back to Herman. So Herman, at the end of his days, he, he moves close to the one family that he'd been close to throughout the years, that the Martin family. And they look out for him. As a matter of fact, 1947, Herman and his brother hadn't spoken for almost 50 years. Ronnie, Ronnie lived in Glo Globe. He'd gone blind. So Herman and supposedly had never talked to him. Billy Martin Jr. said that, you know, Jack, he said, I took Herman out, or my father and I took Herman out to meet with Riney just before he died. And they patched things up. Not many people know this. The stories are that they never saw each other again or never got together, but they did. He said, my father and I took Herman to meet Riney. And they <clears throat> And they let bygones by be bygones in those days because Herman, Riney was blind and he was, you know, on, in fact, right after that meeting, shortly thereafter, Riney took a shotgun and killed himself. We'll get back to this little book. And the little book in it, after the interview with Garman and after the interview with this lady uh, reporter, Herman was very adamant about the same thing. And what was that? And he said in this, you know, I've been all over these mountains. And they asked him, well, are there, is there gold out there? Are there mines out there? And how old are the mines that are out there? Herman looks with a straight face and he says, well, I've traveled those mountains for years. And you see out there, oh, and he pointed, from his cabin site, you could see Iron Mountain. He said, see that <clears throat> mountain way out there? He said, the highest one, that's Iron Mountain. He said, at the base of Iron Mountain, there are two old Spanish mines that I know of. And I know old Jake's mine is out there. Now go find it. And that's what he told Bob Garman. <clears throat> and that's what he told this lady reporter. Well, 
Garmin did go out there, and Garmin found a silver mine up on Fraser Mountain. Uh, became known, I believe, as the... Uh, I believe he was looking for the story called the Lost Wetlatch Mine in Wetlatch Canyon, and it was very close to that. And Garmin found this big old uh, mine, and the mine shaft is there. I went there with Greg Davis one time in the early 90s, and Greg wanted to climb down through all these broken timbers at the top. And climb down in there wanted me to look out for him. I said, and come after him if he can't get out. Greg, you get down there, I ain't going after you. I'm not going into that mine. Because one, I heard a rattlesnake rattle, <laughs> okay? And then the other thing is, it was so busted up, and they, there were no supports, they are all collapsed in. I said, I'm not going into that. Well, another day, Greg and I go out there, so wait a minute. I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, this is in the 90s, before I knew anything about this, this quote, these quotes out of this book. And I'm saying, well, this was gold. Where they find gold, they found silver. They found silver, they found copper, and gold and silver, copper, kind of like go along. First, they find gold and silver at the top, or just silver, and then copper, and it runs the copper as you get down deeper. There's something said to be said about that. Didn't you and Ron Feldman find some of the Peralta mines? Sure enough, uh, in the early 2000, about 2000, Ron Feldman, a noted Dutch hunter, is now looking in the eastern part, and he's gotten a hold of some old notes, and he told you his story because I saw it on YouTube, and he said, uh, well, I'll be digging, Jack, if you got a chance to come out and take a few photos. He knows I'm a photographer and will take photos. And so he, out there, one of the two Spanish mines out there, we determined to be by the age of the timbers underground. Well, they dig out this one, and they're digging out everything by hand and reinforcing it. It's the only way I would go down in there. They reinforce the sides and then the tunnel. And I went down and took photos of the, all of that activity out there. But Ron asked me, what do I know about Spanish mining north of the Gila? I said, well, Ron, I have a few documents. In a binder, I have that many, that many documents that deal with Spanish mining out here in Arizona from the Gila River to the Salt River. And the stories of the Peraltas and the stories, of, yeah, there's a story of a real Peralta listed in the archives that went to the Salt River and found gold there while he was in the military. He was a lieutenant chasing the Apaches in the 1700s. It's in the archives. But that's a horse of a different color and a story for another day there. To get back to Herman, <clears throat> and I went, hey, wait a minute. I got to go back and interview Billy Martin. Did you try and get that story directly from Billy Martin? Not only did Billy Martin tell me the story of the gold, and he wouldn't tell me where it was, but he did take me out and show me where the horse trail, the old horse trail from the JF Trail, which was the Indian runner trail through the mountains and also used by Rebus, who grew vegetables and took them to Silver King, and Pinnell, and also went into Florence, Rivas, the uh, crazy mountain man that lived by himself at a place now called Rivas Ranch. That, what did, I couldn't figure out what the horse trail was. Was there a rock figure of a horse? What the, no, it was a trail that they took to get from the bottom of the JF Trail. It goes up to the top of the ridges above Rogers Canyon. And from those ridges, one of the clues is you can see from above my mind Weaver's Needle. And from but below, if you're down on the old military trail, you cannot see my mind. As a matter of fact, well, I'll get into that story in another time because I walked it both ways, up and down. And yeah, the old horse trail's there. So do you think that Herman eventually found that mine? Yeah. 
think Harmon knew. He knew where the mine was. But the mine was always guarded. Uh, it was always looked after by, guess who? Guess who <clears throat> at the base of the horse trail and the JF Ranch was named after Jack Frazier? Jack Frazier became, quote, probably a multimillionaire in his, in his day. He had mining claims on Alaska and everything. And he owned a vast area called the JF Ranch out there, a lot of cattle. He, he was one of the owners in, uh, in a drugstore in Mesa called Everybody's was the name of the drugstore. Okay? And so Jack Frazier, I have photos of him and everything, but Jack Frazier was also one of the foremen at the Silver King Mine when the soldiers came there. Didn't Frazier win that in a bet? And Jack Frazier founded his... He founded his ranch on a bet between him and the owner of a saloon over who was going to win the next election. And it came time the election come around, Jack Frazier won the bet, yeah. but the saloon owner didn't have, and he owned a restaurant, and he didn't have, in Silver King, he did not have the money to pay him, so he gave him cattle. Game cattle, and that's how Jack Frazier, the legend goes, how he started his, his ranch over in Superstitions called the JF. Very odd that he finds it at the base of what became that established that ranch out there, the JF Ranch. The cabin, I think, is still, hopefully it didn't get burnt down in the fire, but that old horse, Billy Martin took me right out there and showed me the horse trail where it was, showed it to me on a, on a a topo map, and then later I was up there many, many, many times because that was the clue. It became the clue. The JF Trail became the old military trail for me through the mountains because there was no military trail per se, but it became the Indian Runner Trail first from Camp um, Fort McDowell, first with Camp McDowell, and Fort McDowell to Camp Pinnell over top of Superior, it was through the mountains. Because for a runner to go around all the way around the mountains, it just wouldn't, it was too long. So they ran through, they knew the trails, knew the water holes. All right, now getting back to Herman. Well, what I'd like to wrap up with Herman was, he, he gave, he gave many, this book came out, let's see if I can find the date 75. it came out. 75, yeah, but the story was out before that in the newspapers. Okay, Herman's story was out there in the 50s. Herman's story was out there, in the, and he talked about the Northeast version. But then some guys came by and said, oh, the mines at Weaver's Needle. They start perpetuating the lost Dutchman mine and Weaver's Needle. And because that's something that somebody wrote in a book, because they used the name The Needle. And everybody said the needle must be Weaver's Needle that the Dutchman said he could see the needle, thought that was Weaver's needle. But in fact, what he saw wasn't Weaver's needle from the mine. And the area that he, that Herman knew the area. One, I don't understand, people, 75. Why there weren't claims filed? Because before 1984, you could file claims in that area. The last claims I can, I can find filed in that area were in the 1960s. And that whole area there was claimed. It was also claimed, by the way, somebody believed that story because the Woodberries in 1906 came from California to Arizona and they filed 120 claims up in that whole area. But that's another story, but Herman gave the clues. Herman gave the clues to that story of the legend that became the lost Dutchman mine. But Herman didn't tell you the legend. He told you the truth of where two old Spanish mines were found and where gold had been found. What's the most important thing you learned about Herman Petrash? Herman was affiliated with the legend of the Lost Dutchman Mine as one of the first Dutch hunters. But he never gave interviews. He never gave interviews, and he never 
told a story that he thought to be true, the true story of the Lost Dutchman, location of the Lost Dutchman mine. Now, Herman, Herman's brother, Reining, committed suicide. 1953, Herman's on his last leg, and he knows it. Bob Garman had known him for quite some, quite some time. He goes out there and interviews him. And significantly, he says to Bob Garman, and he points over his shoulder, see, that's Iron Mountain. He said, now, and I want to quote him. Herman said, the, the clues to the mine's location lead a reasonable person to conclude that they overwhelmingly point to a formerly rich mine in the high eastern superstition mountains. When he could search no more, he stated, and he points out, he said, out there, past Robles Hills and on to Iron Mountain, he said, out there somewhere is the old Jake mine. Now go find it. That's the two most relevant clues that I have found in all the Dutch Hunter stories. And it's right out of the horse's mouth, right out of the guy that searched the mountains for 50 years for the Dutchman, but he, but Herman was no dummy. He had a claim up there, which gave him legitimate reason to be there to a highly protected mine that was mined during the 1890s and also mined in the early 1900s, the 1940s, et cetera, et cetera. In 1897, Herman filed a mining claim within a stone's throw of the, the mine. But my story on the mine, on the Dutchman mine, is going to take three hours because I'm going to give you the whole background of why I believe that to be. But the two most significant, out of an obscure book like this, why do you believe his statement? Two most significant statements came, came out of a man who knew he was dying and knew he was going to die. Therefore, the old timers, they had a tendency on their deathbed to tell true statements, not to tell lies. They were afraid that would catch up with them. They would not have a chance to seek forgiveness by a higher power by God. So the old timers believe, do not lie when you're old, you tell the truth. And I am old now, and I'm telling you the truth, that Herman's clues, that with everything else, in the 2000s, I was right on the trail, I knew where it was, but I had to prove to everybody where it was, because they wouldn't believe me, in fact, today, if you picked up this book based on Herman's clues and the information I got from Billy Martin Jr. and others, you wouldn't believe the story because it's the truth. People would rather, would rather believe the legend than the truth. If you tell them the truth, they won't believe you. If you tell them the legend, it's at Weaver's Needle, they'll believe you and they'll go out there and kill each other and die of lack of thirst, like they do in the stories I'm about to tell in the future, deaths in the Superstition Mountains. So could the Lost Dutchman Mind have actually been found already? Just another one of those wonderful mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.